So Leviticus 17, 10, and 11 is telling us about the prohibition of eating blood, not that this is the only way you can get an atonement. And the tragedy is that Christians read Leviticus 17, 11 because it is misquoted in the book of Hebrews, but don't read the verse that introduces it. Your pastor will not have an answer. Please try it for yourself. Don't be persuaded by me. I want you to look it up for yourself. Challenge your pastors and reverends for yourself. It's time to repent. It's time to come home. There you go. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Uh, my name is Ryan Poole. I'm from uh, California. Welcome, Ryan. What's the question for Rabbi? I had a question. I know um, I'm a heir to the Jewish community, and I had a question uh, regarding this to uh, about Christianity. I have friends that are Christians, and they uh, believe in drinking the blood and eating the bread of uh, the, their, their Mishiach and all that nonsense. Um, but I had a question. I know to the Jewish uh, Torah, it says that the, there's life in the blood, and so I'm just like, I'm, I'm just... Well, I talk to Christians, they always say that, oh, you're supposed to take communion and all this nonsense, and it's so deeply rooted in paganism. I was wondering what, uh, if Rabbi Singer can uh, answer that question for me. Right. So the question is, we find the Christian ritual of the Eucharist all over the place in the Christian Bible. It's not only in all four Gospels— in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's found in the Last Supper, like Luke 22 is an example. And also in John, not in the Last Supper, for a reason I'm not going into in John chapter 6, verse 54 and 55, 56. But we also find it in Paul's letters, very famously in 1 Corinthians 11, 24, 25, 26. The idea to eat the body and drink the blood of the Messiah. That's ritual cannibalism. Ritual cannibalism is carried out because of a belief, not just in Christianity, but in so many religions, that if you eat the body and drink the blood of a person, you then gain their powers and their strength. None of this is found anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. Cannibalism of and human sacrifice is opposed by the Torah repeatedly, we are warned by the prophets of Israel not to engage in this kind of barbaric practice, although it was widespread um, in the pagan world. It was not just unknown to the Jewish prophets. The Jewish prophets opposed this kind of vulgar practice of human sacrifice. We know why babies and virgins, because they represented innocence, just like Jesus represents innocence to the followers of Christianity. Now, it is true the Torah tells us in Leviticus chapter 17, that something that we now know is the life force of the flesh is in the blood. Back then when the Torah was given, people did not understand that the life force of, of a being is found in the blood. And therefore, you can't drink an animal's blood. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 and verse 11. So there's, the Torah tells us that there is a prohibition. You're not allowed to drink blood. You can't consume blood. Okay? The Torah then tells us why. Well, we now know, we actually knew this from the from the 16th century, Mike, Dr. Michael Severitas, who was murdered by Calvin, believe it or not, he discovered the pulmonary circulation, that blood actually is, uh, is the oxygen is, is put into the blood and that travels to the body. But they didn't know that in the Bronze Age. So the Torah is simply saying that, look, the life of an animal is in the blood. Life of any creature is in the blood. Okay, We now know that, right? If that blood is not infused with oxygen, it's going to die. And therefore, the only permissible act that you can perform with blood is sprinkle it on the altar to make it atone for sin. You can't do anything else with blood. In fact, there's a mitzvah in the Torah, it's repeated a number of times, that when an animal is slaughtered, you have to pour the blood on the ground and cover it 
It's a mitzvah from the Torah to do that, rendering it useless. When shechita is performed, that's ritual slaughtering, the blood must be poured out onto the floor, and a blessing is made over that because you're not allowed to eat blood in some mitzvah to make the blood um, worthless. You can't consume it. That has nothing to do with Hebrews 9.22. The Torah is simply telling us that an animal cannot survive. No creature could survive without its blood. That's where the life force is, is in the blood. And therefore, you can only do one thing with it. You can only, it what it doesn't say is that without the shedding of blood, there's no atonement. That's Hebrews 9.22. That's not Leviticus 17, verse 11. It's ripped completely out of context. When the people of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, were confronted by a reluctant prophet, Jonah, told that their sins were so great that God was going to destroy the city in 40 days, they repented, and God forgave them. And they didn't bring any sacrifices. See Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Look, everything's really at stake here. They were forgiven for their sins without any sacrifices. When Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was confronted by Daniel, he had a dream in chapter 4. Listen carefully, because it's really life and death spiritually right now for you. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar has a, a dream about a tree, a tree that gave life to everything around it, so powerful, so awesome. All animals just enjoyed this tree. And then ultimately it's destroyed, and Nebuchadnezzar is made to understand that his dream is a portent of doom for him. In verse 24, in a Jewish Bible, or verse 27 in a Christian Bible, it's the same verse, just the chapters are cut differently. Listen carefully. Daniel advises Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he says, if you give charity, God will forgive your sins. If you look that up now, you will leave the church. If you ask your pastor, how is it that charity could atone for sins when Paul claims that the only way to have an atonement is through blood, your pastor will not have an answer. Please try it for yourself. Don't be persuaded by me. I want you to look it up for yourself. Challenge your pastors and reverends for yourself. It's time to repent. It's time to come home. And when David was confronted by his sin through a juridical parable and repented, God forgave him without any sacrifice in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. So Leviticus 17, 10, and 11 is telling us about the prohibition of eating blood, not that this is the only way you can get an atonement. And the tragedy is that Christians read Leviticus 17, 11 because it is misquoted in the book of Hebrews, but don't read the verse that introduces it. Moreover, Leviticus 17, 11 begins with the word because, for, oh, this is because. What does that tell you? If someone starts a sentence and goes, this is because, you should be asking the question, what is because? Like, what are you talking about? I hope you're getting this, that Every Christian proof text that's misquoted by the church is ripped out of context. Every one of them is ripped out of context. The context of Leviticus 17 is why it is forbidden to eat blood, why it's prohibited. So Leviticus tells us that the life force of the, of the being is in the blood. It's in the blood. We now know the science behind that. Okay, so we know the Torah is Torah is not a science book. It's not interested in telling us about microbiology. But when it's germane to how you should bathe, the Torah says, uh, by the way, the life force of the flesh is in the blood. And therefore, you can use it for one thing. If, you, if, you, if you're not using it to sprinkle on the altar for atone for sins, you must cover it over with dirt. You can never use it. That's why. It's not saying that there is no other way to atone for sins. In fact, the, the blood sacrifices like the sin offering is only useful for sins that are committed unintentionally. Please read Leviticus chapter 4. If you commit a sin intentionally, it, it won't help you. 
or if you confess your sin and there's no evidence, so then there was a special carbon asham, a guilt offering in Leviticus 5 and 6. And if you brought a sacrifice or went into the temple in a state of impurity during the year, so you can atone for that sin by having a sacrifice brought in a state of purity on your behalf. That only relates to the Mikdash, the sanctuary. See Leviticus 16, verse 16. Christians are genuinely under the impression that when the temple is standing, all atonement was achieved through one avenue, through one conduit, and that's blood. Why? Because Christians are evil? No. They've been misled by the book of Hebrews, by the letters of Paul. I don't blame them. This is like in their head every Sunday, every Bible class, pounding, pounding, pounding. And they believe it. The only thing I say, the only thing I say that Christians are responsible for is they really should be looking this up for themselves. But, in fact, they're not taught to. They're not taught to examine these things for themselves. They don't go back to Leviticus and look up the context. That's why you have really good people who are in the church who just take the pastor's word for it. That's why there are people who go every Sunday to their Christian services and Bible classes during the week and just buy it because this is what they're preachers drum into their heads. So they really think that. I don't know love. Asher malach Beterem kol Yetzir nivra Let nasa 